up, big. I don't even know if it's on front camera or back <laughs> camera. Hang on, we're approaching a light. And it's on our faces. Hello. So it's about 6 a.m. Oh, God, it feels like the middle of the night. Yeah, it does feel like the middle of the night. Uh, I'm running about three hours sleep. Mum's running on about <laughs> four hours sleep. <laughs> oh, ponies are awake. Uh, yeah. Bear's ready for food. Good morning, girls. Um, yeah, we're going to... Do all the ponies. God, it's pitch black in here as well. And then we will catch up in the car and we'll talk about what we're doing today. It's very exciting. Not eventing. Oh, bags Hi for girls. life. Look at those eyes. Wow. I can do my makeup in the car. Okay, just breaking uh, water troughs. Lovely stuff. Good girl, Jamie and Bebe. Oh, it's so foggy. There's a comet to the bar. It's a cuzzy. Right, mum's got a high vis on, you know, <laughs> just in case. God, I need to do my makeup. I look like a I'm going to put potato. Nice. Case of emergencies. Good idea. <laughs> right, we'll get in the car and then we'll tell you where we're going. Maggie's got a pillow. Got my pillow, got my blanket. I'm going to catch up on some sleep <laughs> while poor mum drives. <laughs> when you have three hours sleep. See? Amazing what a lot of concealer can do, the isn't it? Power of makeup. <laughs> hey, that is hobbit abuse. About ten minutes. Oh, I've not worn my watch. Ten minutes ago I was asleep or trying to sleep anyway, but here I am looking fabulous. Um so today we are at the Healthy Horse Conference, which is basically Horse Health Conference, Seaman. What's it's called. Today we are at the Horse Health Conference. <laughs> Arranged by? Arranged by NKC Equestrian. So obviously you know I'm a brand ambassador for them, her, Nicola. Nicola. Um, so yeah, it's basically a massive conference where they have loads of guest speakers, including Sue Dyson, which I'm sure a lot of horsey people know because she's a very well-known vet, isn't she? Yeah, I think she applies as the Olympic team, is that correct? I don't know, but it sounds good, so let's leave that in. Um, we'll let you know later. And I think we've also got Hagen doing like a talk on forage and stuff. So it's basically just a whole day's worth of like talking about your horse's health. So we're going to be talking about spotting lameness, I think there's stuff on weight, colic, mm. all like literally everything to do with your horse's health from an owner's point of view. And it's also like people like um, physios and stuff come, don't they, to get there like train oh, I can't remember the proper name like a training thing it's an early start we're not really with it but we can we'll fill you like in later 30. but yeah it's going to be really interesting but I yeah. thought instead of really sitting in the car and us two idiots talking who don't know much we'll film as much as we can and yeah you can hopefully learn a thing or two and there's going to be an opportunity to get a discount I believe for next year if people ah. would like to come so we'll talk more about that later yeah. but I've heard there's pastries inside so we better go we, we best See you there. Guys, look at this spread. Where are the pastries? There's biscuits over there. I've got my uh, fruit, pastries and tea. I'm feeling more like a human being now. Um, yeah, we're gonna go and sign in, get our goodie box and then get learning. Right, this is the kind of horsey activity I can get used to. <laughs> Food, tea, goodie bag, inside and Hobbit. Not a bad day so far, guys. It really isn't. Oh, look. Oh, do show, do show. Oh, hello. <laughs> There's Nicola looking mighty fresh. <laughs> oh, look. Aww. Horses, divorce, and hissy fits. <laughs> There you go, Mum. A teenage drama. <laughs> Might be a bit old for that. That looks good. Oh, look. Lovely cards. Oh, oh my God, that's so sweet. Oh, I love that. Strangely horse. Maybe we'll learn about that breed of horse today. <laughs> oh, horse bits. Hello. You'll enjoy them, won't you, Robert? You love one of them. <laughs> we get stuck on the way home. <laughs> Oh, oh look, 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 look. A horsey tape weight measure. Uh -oh. Weight measure. That won't fit around you then, Mum. <laughs> Make notes. Yeah. 
Very good. Exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe just a seat. What are you reading there, Hobbs? Um, managing the overweight horse. So I'm Nicola, I own and run NQC Equestrian Training. I know lots of you have come on my courses before, so it's lovely to see some familiar faces and great to see some new faces as well. It's yeah. absolutely lovely to see you all, so thank you so much for um, <coughs> giving up your time on a Saturday. Um, but don't worry, we should get you home in time for either celebrity um, the important things in life. Okay, I'm speaking about the overweight horse, so surely I'm standing here and my 1,500 horses at Red Wings Horse Sanctuary, they're all perfect weight. They're not. And I'd like to say, first of all, I do feel your pain. I'm going to talk to you today about tips to help get your horses the right weight. But every horse is an individual. In horses are in situations where food is plentiful, food is abundant. Obviously, they take in a lot of calories that they don't need to use right there, right now. And it is stored either in, as, um, in the liver as glycogen or as fat. So in the summer and the winter, if you are a wild horse, your body weight <coughs> fluctuates every year. So during the summer, plentiful food, you're roaming around, you've got lots of grass, you can do some foraging. So gradually over the course of the summer, your body weight will naturally go up. Come winter, obviously the food decreases in amount, it decreases in the starches and sugars in it, but also you're using calories to keep warm and you're having to walk an awful lot further to find the food that is available and the body weight comes down. Now one of the things I'd like to really um, sort of talk about today, I am going to talk about dieting horses. None of us in the room like a diet and you know that new year is coming. Every magazine will be, you know, new year, new you. Go out and drink some cinnamon with some maple syrup in it and look like Beyonce, <laughs> oh, if only. So in actual fact, what we need to think about with our horses, yes, I'm going to talk about diets, because if you get a horse diagnosed with laminitis, you need to put it on a diet. But I also want to talk about ways that we can start to mimic this natural cycle that we would find in the world. Because the one thing we're doing with our horses is they're gradually putting on weight over the summer we're maintaining that over the winter. And they put on weight the next summer, we're maintaining it over that winter. And that's the cycle we're getting in, and if we can start to break down that cycle, then our lives will be a lot easier. This is quite a recurring theme. Now, this is Paddy. Paddy was one of my success stories by the end of the summer, but at the beginning of the summer, Paddy made me want to cry quite a lot. Um, but um, if you imagine a cross section through a horse's neck, I mean, just looking at Paddy's head end, you can imagine that's a lovely muscle growth built up the neck. Um, but if you think about it, you know, you've got your jugular groove here, you've got your spinal column muscles around it here. Then you've got your neutral ligament with some muscle either side, but unfortunately for Paddy, the majority of that is fat. Now that's, the, that's something that if you saw him every day, you just think he looks like a lovely, oh, lovely rounded neck. Now, one of the things we need to realize, horses ain't the same as us. We have a very different thermoneutral zone. Now, a thermoneutral zone is the zone at which we take no extra energy to either keep cool or keep warm. So in the human, our thermoneutral zone is from 20 to 35 degrees. Now you may think 35 degrees sounds very high. These figures are naked. So that is our thermoneutral zone, okay? In the horse, it's completely offset to ours. It's five to 25 degrees. But here's the best thing. We're not even talking about acclimatized horses. So horses that actually live in cold countries that are cold all year round and are so used to living out, it might be as low as minus 15 to 10. So we've got to appreciate when we are cold, our horses 
probably not. And, and that's a whole reset of the mind. And it's not easy to do, but we need to start to do it. Right, thank you for listening, everybody. And this part is very much about what actually is lameness. And this is because with modern technology, we can measure objectively horses' movements. And the scientists that have been actively involved in this have suddenly realized that there are lots of horses that are moving asymmetrically. And they're beginning to panic. So they're saying, do these horses genuinely have pain? For me, lameness is a generally a pain-induced abnormality that I can reduce by the use of local anesthesia. Now this horse shows an obvious neck fall in lameness. The head goes down as the right hind limb, as the right front limb hits the ground. It was sore after the turn. And look at the horse's facial expression. Its ears are back, it's, it's got this intense stare in its eyes. Think about that. This horse is expressing signs of pain. And it opens its mouth as well. I haven't even got a rider on it yet. Horses can talk to us. We need to learn to listen to them. going to the left. People tend to think that horses will always be lamer in front than the affected limb on, on the inside of the circle, but that's not necessarily the case, as we clearly see here. Because this horse, horse has switched from a left fall of lameness in straight lines to a severe right fall of lameness going to the left. And now it's going to the right, and the left fall of lameness recurs and is severe. Uh, now we see why the horse was short-stepping yeah. in straight lines. It's short-stepping because both forelimbs hurt. It's just the left forelimb hurt more than the right forelimb in straight lines. This horse is showing a very low-grade right hind limb lameness in hand. And it is quite common with hind limb lameness that the lameness will be accentuated with a rider. And it will often be accentuated when the rider sits on the diagonal of the lame limb. Now we can see a much more obvious right yeah. hind limb lameness. The rider is in rising trot and we're going to the left. The rider is going to the right. She's sitting on the with the left hind and the right hind with the left fore and the right hind limb are bearing weight and a very obvious right hind limb lameness. So the lameness can be much more obvious when the horse is ridden. And sometimes it's going to be apparent only when ridden. And all goes to the left, the rider is taken, the right shoulder goes down, and you develop concavity on your right side. So if we see a crooked rider, we have to say, is the rider crooked because the saddle is slipping? Saddle slip, which is happening constantly, will also, particularly in the winter months, result in asymmetrical hair wear under the caudal aspect of the saddle, underneath the back of the saddle. In the winter months, in some horses, you will see slight symmetrical hair wear. If the saddle is slipping, that hair wear will be asymmetrical, with greater hair wear on the side to which the saddle is slipping. We know it is not induced by the rider in the majority of cases, because even if we see the horse in hand or on the lunge, the saddle will slip. So it must be influenced by the movement of the horse's back. This horse had a mild bilateral hind limb lameness, right hind limb lameness predominating, and the saddle is going to the right. 
We often will see that if the saddle slips, the saddle will slip more in canter than in trot. We know that trot is a symmetrical gait, it is a diagonal two-beat gait, whereas canter is an asymmetrical gait initiated by the outside hind limb and then the inside hind limb and the outside forelimb bearing weight and then the leading forelimb. So in this horse we can see we've got mild saddle slip to the right in trot and more severe saddle slip in canter. And we can see that the rider can compensate in trot and remains reasonably straight, but in canter, <coughs> she's begin, she has begin, begun to sit very, very crookedly. And the earlier we diagnose them, the more likely we are to be able to resolve them. I think that ridden exercise, for me, is a fundamental part of any lameness evaluation, unless the horse is too lame to be ridden. The presence of saddle slip may be an indicator of the presence of hind limb lameness. A crooked tail is seen more frequently in lame horses than it is in non-lame horses. And, probably most importantly, horses are trying to communicate with us and we have to learn how to communicate with them. We need to learn to listen, to observe their behaviour and interpret that behaviour appropriately. So look, see, Think. Okay, it is our first coffee break. We've got cookies and cake. Met my friend Katie. More biscuits left. So we'll. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. We'll have a little chat in a minute. So, just had a talk about obese horses, but not about obese people. No. So, <laughs> that's a donut and a giant cookie on my plate. I do want to point out these plates are smaller than normal plates. Look at it in comparison to the mug. It's not a massive plate full of cookies, <laughs> what I'm trying to say. What we're going to do is give you a little bit of new and, and old information, little bits of what you know, and then feeding in some of the new research work that, that, that we've, been, we've been doing. I'm lucky I've got free labour, so I work at the Royal Agricultural University in Sirencester, and we've got lots of students who want to do projects. So, um, so we get them in and, and, uh, and to do all sorts of, of uh, things. What I'm going to start off with is looking at um, the digestive anatomy, because I think that we look at these lovely horses we've just watched from, from Sue's talk about horses moving, and, and we forget that there's a big digestive system in there, and what that actually means to us when we're feeding them. So I'm going to just do a quick sort of overview of that, around about 20 metres, as I say, depending on, on, on um, how big the horse is. And then we've got this large intestine. The large intestine is 30 litres, maybe slightly smaller, maybe quite a bit bigger, depending, depending on the horse's size. So this is what you've got, and this is the bit that we need to concentrate on. Because we know that the horse's appetite is around about 25 to 3% of its body weight per day. So you've got to get the feed into this triangle to this amount of dry matter per day. So what controls that? What actually makes the horse want to eat that much? Well, there are two things that actually influence how much is in the gut, how much is held in the gut, and how quickly it goes through. And this is the rate of passage of food. Now, horses have got a dynamic system, unlike cattle, which is a very static system where they eat something and then they lie down and they ruminate. Horses don't do that. Horses can actually um, select, uh, cream off the best and reject the rest. So they can actually put a lot of food through their system in a relatively short time. So an average mean retention time in, in, a, in a horse or a pony is anything from 25 to maybe 34 at the outside. It's not the book value of, 20, of 42 hours. So a horse's digestive system is very dynamic, it moves very quickly. Well, if you feed, for example, 12 kilograms of a haylage per day, now, Cattle to cattle, to, well, we'll tell you a little bit about this as well, is that it's very difficult to categorize hay and haylage because what are they? They can be very different. So I've just taken a, one that I would regard as fairly typical of 65% dry matter, and it might have eight megajoules of DE per kilogram dry matter. So if you feed 12 kilograms of haylage, you're feeding 62 megajoules of, of energy per day. Then you think, well, actually, I do need a little bit of a supplement and I like to bucket feed my horse and I can't catch the damn thing in the field unless I take a bucket with me, so what am I going to feed? Well, you can now feed a lots of fibre diets in a bucket. 
you don't have to reach for the cereals. So if you, for example, you wanted to say, well, I want to give the horse breakfast, and I want to give the horse an evening meal or whatever, then you can feed one kilogram of alpha A, add 0.25 kilograms of sugar beet pulp, that's dry before you soak it, and then maybe a little bit of soybean meal, because I'm a little bit nervous sometimes in our UK fibres about the amount of available protein from things like haylage and, and hay. So a nice pro small amount of protein is, is um, a specific protein that we know is, is available in the small intestine is very good. Now that is, is equivalent to a mug, a coffee mug, or, or, so, or something like that, of, of soy bean meal a day. So it's very little. It's expensive, but it, the bag lasts you a long time. So that gets us up then to 75 megajoules per day on a fiber only diet. So that just shows you how you can feed. And that's just a very simple, that's sort of at the back of a bag packet type of calculation. But it demonstrates to you how you can actually meet the energy requirements of this horse on a very simple fiber only diet. You will lose a lot of the nutrients. A lot of those, um, particularly minerals and soluble protein, but particularly minerals that you're, the valuable minerals that they need, the electrolytes, they, they get lost, sodium, potassium, etc. We do get an increase in bacteria. Some question about whether that will actually influence uh, FY gastric ulceration syndrome. Not, don't really think it does actually, but we are altering the, the, the profile slightly. The other biggest problem is that the biological oxygen demand of this post-soaked liquor is huge. It's equivalent to raw sewage. So you should not be putting that down strong drains. Um, it is though effective for laminitis for, or for reducing the water-soluble carbohydrates in laminitis. The problem with that is that when you soak, you might get rid of lots of sugars and you might get rid of very few sugars. And we're working on this trying to find out what characteristics of hay will actually influence how much sugar you do and you don't lose. So if you've got a laminitic, you do not want water-soluble carbohydrates going in there. And still, the most effective way of getting rid of those WSC is to soak, but I suggest that you take a sample of your head and send it all for analysis because you don't know if you're getting rid of only 20% of sugars or if you're getting rid of 60 or 70% of sugars. And unfortunately, that's something that we can't predict just at the moment. It could just be a simple thing. You might have to think a little bit about what sort of mix or what fiber I put in here or what I do, but your, your feed room should not be full of 15 to 20 different ingredients. Sometimes I go onto yards and somebody's mixing eight or nine different things mm -hmm. into a single feed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how they remember to do all of that in the correct way, but keep it simple, okay? Base the diet on quality forage and highly digestible fiber feeds. If then you're running out of steam, think then, sit back and think then, but this should be <coughs> the first thing that you do. And make sure your horse has feed available and as close to 16 hours per day as you possibly can. If you do all of that, result happiness. <laughs> well, I think there's no universal definition, and it's going to depend on you and your horse. It may be driven a little bit by marketing, but it's possibly going to be breed dependent. It might, as we hear later on, be linked to whether you're a pony or a horse. Interesting stuff, very new stuff. And I think it also depends on things like what we're talking about. So for a reproductive mare over 15, they start getting worried. But we all know that dressage and show jumpers may not reach their peak till 15. So you can't tell me a show jumper is older than 15 when it's winning at Olympics. So I think this is where we have to be careful. And I think it's changing. So if you did on a scientific terminology of demographic age, back in the 2000s, early 2000s, horses became old at 16. Now they're getting old on a demographic de definition way beyond 20. As was shown here, a lot of you have horses that are over 20. So if there's no other slide you remember from my talk, this is the one that age is individually variable, thank goodness for all of us as well. But that means that you will have to have a different approach depending on whether your horse is showing signs of age or it's not showing signs of age. And that can change quickly. The older they get, and I know Nikki and I have done lots of talks on senior horses, monitoring is key. 
And I think Nicky also is saying, get friends to check periodically, because you only see those gradually salami. Get somebody else. This is a key slide. But consider them as individuals. Keep on monitoring. Consider. And then we can keep our horses healthy throughout. And <laughs> monitoring is key. And um, this is now the son, he's now 25, so he's now an oldie. And that was him a couple of days ago, just saying good night to us all. <laughs> right, ladies, gather round, gather round. I'm having an amazing buffet lunch. This is my, uh, my first serving. I will be going up again. Also, I just need to show you this properly. Look at the, uh, the dessert selection. Never been so well looked after in my life. Meg situated herself right next to the dessert table. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Sorry, Maria. Look at this buffet. Oh, 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 oh. I have so many of the food. Having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Amazing. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not even going to show you my second plate of food because it's bigger than the first. How disgraceful. Objective ways, but in standardized ways, first of all, to say, was the saddle in balance? Was the seat horizontal where the rider sits, or did it tip forwards, or did it tip backwards? What was the length of the saddle relative to the horse's back? Did the tree of the saddle extend beyond the 18th rib? What about the front of the saddle? Where were the tree points relative to the scapula? Bearing in mind the scapula outlined by this white line has to rotate backwards as the forearm is brought brought forwards. <coughs> if the tree points are too tight, or if the tree points are in too close proximity to the scapula, then that movement of the scapula, and therefore movement of the entire forearm, is going to be jeopardized. Back, pressure under the front, and I can see daylight through the middle. You're going to have focal increased pressure underneath the front and the, and, and the back of the saddle. And that is likely on a long-term basis to result in pain. It's also going to compromise muscle function because we know that um, during exercise, a horse which works properly should expand the muscles of its back. We can show measurable increases in the dimensions of a horse's back after a 30-minute period of exercise if it is a sound horse and it is a sound horse working correctly. So for long-term muscle health, we need the muscles to contract and relax normally. They need to be able to expand during exercise. In association with a saddle that doesn't fit, horses reduce the range of motion of the back. They stiffen their back. And by stiffening their back, they're not using the muscles properly. Muscles that are not used properly will um, atrophy. They will get smaller because they're dependent on, on use to be, maintain their bulk. Intense stare in its eyes. <coughs> Some of the stiff, stilted canter. Very little movement through the horse's back. <coughs> Now we've just put a, a conventional saddle on the horse. It slowed down. It was running away before. It slowed down. Its head and neck have come down. It's got increased range of motion through the back. Paradoxically, it's now showing a more obvious forelimb lameness than before because having <coughs> let go with its back because it's not bracing against that uncomfortable saddle, um, it allows the horse to show its forelimb lameness. Still come to sometimes switches its tail, but remember this horse has got lameness in several legs in addition to the ill-fitting saddle. The point is we've transformed this horse's way of moving just by removing the ill-fitting saddle and replacing it with a, a better fitting saddle. And the difference is quite profound. Or because they don't haven't developed the musculoskeletal strength and coordination to maintain themselves in the correct position, or a combination thereof. So 
I just had a, a, a group of photographs of consecutive horses that I'd examined. And there were 34 horses and riders, and they were assessed by 12 evaluators. And I just asked them, are the riders shoulder, hip, and heel in alignment? Is the rider sitting too far back in the saddle? Or can we see space behind the rider and in front of the rider? And is the rider too big for the saddle? And this is only based on 34 horses, but are the riders shoulder, hip, and heel in alignment? No, 88%. Oh, that's a bit of a dismal statistic. Is the rider sitting too far back on the saddle? Yes, 59%. Again, a disturbing statistic. Is the rider too big for the saddle? 41%. This is not very good, but this is what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. We have done a pilot study assessing the influence of rider size on horse performance. So we had four riders, a lightweight, a moderate weight, a heavyweight, and a very heavy rider, riding six different horses in a crossover design. And they were of similar ability and similar riding fitness. And uh, they were performing a 30 minute dressage type test, walk top canter, very basic maneuvers. And we were looking at um, objective evaluation of gait, we were measuring heart rates, respiratory rates, looking at salivary cortisol concentrations, um, and we were looking at back dimensions before and after exercise and palpating the back before and after exercise. And as a kind of insurance policy, we had agreed ahead of the study that if any horse showed um, a grade three out of eight lameness that developed, and these were all horses that were clinically sound, if they developed lameness during the test, the test would be terminated immediately. Um, this was in the slightly earlier days of the ethogram, the 24 behavior ethogram, and we chose a cutoff of 10, which was, I just felt quite generous. Retrospectively, it probably should have been eight, but uh, we, we weren't sure where, how accurate that cutoff of eight was, so we chose 10. And all the tests for the heavy and the very heavy rider had to be abandoned either because of lameness, which occurred in six of the seven tests, or the demonstration of 10 or more behaviors, which occurred once for the uh, heavy rider uh, in cancer. And we hadn't anticipated that at all. We were, we were somewhat surprised and dismayed by this, but it was very strong data. Correct saddle fit for both the horse and the rider is crucial, I believe, for equine thoracolumbar function and for optimal performance of the horse. You've seen several examples where the horse's performance has been significantly compromised by the saddle and their performance has immediately improved after exchange to a better fitting saddle. The saddle must fit the rider appropriately to give them the chance to be in balance appropriately so that they can sit with their shoulder, hip, and heel in alignment, and they can keep that alignment when they're moving with the horse. And if the stirrup bars are in the wrong position for the rider, or if the saddle seat is of the wrong dimension for the rider, or the saddle flaps are of the wrong dimension and shape for the rider, that cannot happen. If the saddle tips backwards, the rider is going to find it challenging to ride in balance. So it is absolutely crucial that the saddle fits the rider as well. I think we have to accept the situation that for some horses and some riders, we cannot find an appropriate fit for both the horse and for the rider. This horse has got a short back conformation. This rider's buttocks are overhanging the back of the saddle. We know from pressure measurements underneath the saddle that the pressures under here will be substantially increased, which is a bad thing. There is some evidence that uh, increased pressures under the back of the saddle versus the front of the saddle are more adversely uh, bad for the horse um, than higher pressures under the front of the saddle. So with this horse rider combination, 
I don't think it will be possible to provide a saddle which will fit the horse without being right over the lumbar region and also accommodate the size of the rider. So I have to address this issue. And I take this very seriously because I think it is a challenging situation to face. Um, it has to be done with tact and diplomacy and some riders don't like hearing this. Um, but I think that I feel as a profession, we as the veterinarians have to take on this mantle of responsibility. Um, it's not easy, and it's certainly not easy for the very young members of the profession, but I think, uh, I feel I have to lead by example and address these problems. And then we have to think about rider position. I think it is really crucial that as riders, People become more aware of their position and what it does to the horse. Look at this rider and the way she sits way over to the right. Mm -hmm. Look at the relative positions of her heels. Look at this rider who's leaning over to the right. And this rider who's not only uh, looking down, but she's twisting her upper body um, and her whole pelvis is rotating. All of these things are going to have profound influences on the way in which the horse moves in the short term and the longer term consequences of riders sitting like this um, are very significant, I believe. So, a, a rather controversial topic, but I think a hugely important topic from an equine welfare point of view. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Compared to the people you've been listening to so far, I am very much the bog standard vet on the panel. Um, so I'm a local practicing vet, was lucky enough to uh, look after Nicholas Horse for, for a while, and uh, I'm delighted to come and uh, talk to you this afternoon on what can the tech tell your vet. Now, that's a little bit of a loose title, but just why is a sort of bog standard equine vet from this area coming to talk to you about it? Um, I, in, 2009, so 10 years ago, I, I got onto the Council of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, which is the veterinary regulator, and um, I have subsequently become uh, the lead for a thing called ViVet, which is the network for veterinary innovation. And it's been absolutely fascinating to uh, be exposed to all the exciting things that are, are, are coming. And now I hear people say, oh, when I explain what we're certainly saying, oh, that's really scary. And actually, I don't think we should be scared by any of it. Some of it's going to be useless, because actually, that's the thing about innovation. A fair degree of it falls flat on its face and will never be used. But there'll be some really good things to come out of it, and really useful things. And so what we're going to do is, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are now, and, and where, uh, sort of where we've got to as vets. And, and, and it's moved on dramatically in the 20 years that I've been working in this area. Sometimes go down the wrong route. Um, and it was the right route at the time, but we had a very short period of time, relatively, where we started to use treadmills. And we would had to, you had to spend a few days training this horse to gallop on a treadmill, and you were scoping it while it was uh, on the mill, and then suddenly it treadmill, and then suddenly these overground endoscopy uh, units started to come out. And as long as you're within a reasonable <coughs> distance of the of the, the laptop, you can actually see as the horse is galloping along what's going on in the airway, which is a fantastic. Uh, uh, development and really useful <coughs> for um, actually finding out what is causing the noise that a horse is making when it's exercised. Show you that we are overfaced by an awful lot of technological stuff coming online, but if you are hypercritical about it and adopt it sensibly, I hope you'll be encouraged to believe that actually we're heading in a, in a very exciting direction where we're going to get much more precise um, treatment. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for Sue about the um, saddle fitting. If you, for example, had the best fitting saddle of a horse but it didn't fit the rider that it was intended for, um, is that better than a saddle that potentially doesn't fit the horse as well but is more suited to the rider? I think the horse's comfort is by far the most important, but some of the saddles can be adapted. So, for example, you have a plenty of conventional saddle and the seat is not long enough for the rider. You can extend the length of the seat without extending the length of the tree. You can alter the flat size.
so a saddle could be customized to the rider who was originally put the horse by changing the length of the seat and changing the saddle pad and even changing the position of the bars. Yeah. Um, and some manufacturers offer much more flexibility with respect to the rider. Thanks, Christian. Please thank you for Still got my little name badge on. I'm just gonna leave it on because I feel quite professional. Yeah, I was probably gonna wear it for most of my vlogs now, just so you know who I am, guys. Probably reads backwards for you, but you're gonna wear it to You're smart. I think I might. Could do. Know like, yeah, people know I am. It's awfully dark. That's because it's 20 past four. Yeah. It's the 30th of November. And it is. It's getting dark early now. Anyway, we have had such a fun day a fun and educational day i feel like my brain is about to pop trying to withhold all this information we have quite a small brain right are you going to cooperate or should i just do it myself it's quite frank this attitude is disgusting <sighs> honestly what was your favorite bit today um well it was my first time meeting sue dyson and I must say, I found both of her talks really, really interesting. She was amazing. She was, there's just nothing she doesn't know. It was like, I could have sat and listened to her for absolutely hours. I, could have, I thought that I could listen to her all day. Yeah, <laughs> Sue, like, sing me to sleep. <laughs> okay, that sounds weird. That weird. I don't think Sue's gonna watch this, so we're fine. We are fine. Someone but if you are Sue. <laughs> oh God, yeah. No one tell Sue. I thought she was great. She, the, the comparisons of watching the lame horses was so interesting like yeah. and seeing how some can trot up completely sound and then you put and a rider on them and they go lame yeah. yeah and oh. that there was a dressage horse that was sound to be ridden until you started asking it to do sort of lateral movements and test it a bit and then it was like hopping lame and it's just it was really interesting so many but things that you totally depressing yeah well that's the thing because so many things you bypass is like oh it's just them being naughty or something and it's like actually horses don't really have the capacity to like they they don't annoy us on purpose they're not naughty on purpose i've been saying that to you for years megan elphick no you haven't but it's it's easy to ignore things isn't it like if i come in from a schooling session being like oh yeah she was she was crooked to the right doing really my shoulders in on the right rein no but I've, no but like just when they're crooked you just think yeah. like you just think oh they were just crooked today and it's like yeah. actually should you be looking into that a little bit more yeah but yeah it's it was really interesting, but I think you, we've got to keep that balance of noting things, but not you can you can scaremonger yourself a yeah. bit, can't you? You can scare yourself. Well, and you could easily uh, believe that um, no horses sound. Yeah, but no, they were amazing, and I really I found the like the saddle fitting talk with her as well really really interesting yeah. and about the weight and the height of riders, how much difference that makes. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of stuff on horses' weight and the forage, which was. Again, very interesting. I mean, having native ponies, we we are just on an uphill battle, aren't we? Yeah, that was depressing. I tell you what, the other the other thing which I found really interesting was about the rugs, and they're telling us about a study they've done, and like just a thin fleece, like one you'd put on to go to a show, added 12 degrees of heat to a horse, and it was in like that was at like four degrees, so it was a cold day. Yeah and a fleece made the horse 12 degrees hotter. That like that yeah. blew my mind, because when it's four degrees at home, I'm pro I've probably got two rugs on my horses. It's just scary, isn't it? I think one of the big take home messages was, we need to stop- Take some rugs off. No, but like stop treating our horses how we'd want to be treated and treat them like a horse, because mm. we think like, oh, we're cold, put another yeah. rug on, or yeah. oh, we like variety in our food, like give them a scoop of this, a scoop of that, and like all these cereals, it's like, Actually, if we just detached ourselves from yeah. this sort of marketing yes. way, you know, everything's marketed now to us rather than the horse, isn't it? So I think if we just treat them a bit more like a horse. Really, do they? No, but it's. But we as owners are very Yeah, sensitive. it's more, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely given us both food for thought. Just. Really, really interesting. I'd definitely go to one again because I feel like 
feel like I could sit through that whole thing again and I'd learn something else just because yeah, you need true. like there was so taken. much, yeah. That's that true. you could just watch the same thing over and over. Yeah, really, really interesting and yeah. certainly given us stuff to think about and look into more. Yeah. Do some of our own research. In terms of what I've vlogged, I obviously I like these speeches were like an hour long, so I obviously haven't included all that. I've tried to do a bit of the intro and the outro and maybe some stuff in the middle. Uh, but it's, this is really just to give you a taste of what's going on. Obviously, if it interests you, you're better off booking and coming on one of these conferences or booking even one of the online first aid courses will give you a lot of information. Um, so yeah, that's this isn't really to show you, you know, exactly what's said. Yeah. Yeah. It's just to give you an idea of what to expect. What, yeah, what happens. Yeah. So I hope it has done exactly that and hopefully it's been interesting to you. Uh, yeah, comment your thoughts below guys and some of the bits you have seen, do you agree with it or disagree with it or whatever, I'll be interested to hear your thoughts because there's certainly lots to talk about. Uh, yeah. All that's left to say is a massive thank you to Nicola for inviting us along. Yes, thank you very much Nicola. In fact, very the last the last thing to say is, my goodness was the food fantastic. Wow, the amount of breaks, we've had hot cookies, hot donuts, lunchtime there was a buffet, all you can eat, followed by dessert. Yeah, I'd probably be on half a stone for you. Yeah. Anyway, so Don't thank mind. you Nicola and thank you for the food. <laughs> uh, but I hope you've enjoyed watching guys and I will see you very, very soon. See you in the next vlog. Over and out. Adios.